the corresponding know, like, right well, and that's, that's so one of the most exciting important things towards just like solving this climate issue is so real the corresponding like, right most right. right. real connection of just being out in the garden for hours and and first memory engaging in nature what we're doing you know people have to feel a part of it we can't bring solutions to people reducing emissions and being an advocate for electric school buses the carbon the, that these the, kids the are exposed to is not just on the bus or providing or technologies that are just going to say christy gamble has a lot to teach us about bridging divides she's a sustainability leader at a concrete company but not just any concrete company Carbon Cure captures carbon dioxide and stores it in concrete, effectively removing carbon from the atmosphere. And in 2021, it won an X Prize in a competition to turn CO2 emissions into valuable products. We'll talk with her about how she does it, how she's motivated by her children, and how this new technology works. Welcome, Christy. This is Degrees, real talk about planet-saving careers. I'm your host, Yesh pavlik Slink from Environmental Defense Fund. Let's use our jobs to save the planet. I live in Chicago, and we have two seasons here, winter and construction. From April to October, there's no shortage of steamrollers repaving I-94 and cement trucks pouring foundations for yet another building. I love this city. I want people to have places to live and safe streets to drive on. But I feel conflicted. New building construction accounts for nearly 40%, 40% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. Do we really need all of this construction? It's a big climate conundrum. Well, I recently found some hope by talking with Christy Gamble. She's the sustainability director at a clean tech company called Carbon Cure. They're doing something that, at first, sounded impossible to me. Making concrete green. Really? So concrete can be used as a solution in the global climate challenge because it can actually get rid of carbon dioxide. Change is coming, oh yeah. Ain't no holding it back. Ain't no running. Change is coming, oh yeah. This is Degrees, real talk about planet-saving careers from Environmental Defense Fund, and I'm your host, Yesh pavlik Slank. For the better part of the last decade, it's been my job and my honor to help students use their talent and their passion to get experience and jobs that serve the planet. Today, I'm talking with Christy Gamble of Carbon Cure. Reducing the carbon footprint of the construction industry is vital to saving the planet, and there's no better place to start than with concrete. Back in 2021, Carbon Cure won an X Prize. They capture carbon dioxide from the air and then store it in concrete forever. X Prize judges called it a quote, game changer for global decarbonization. This is huge for two reasons. One, concrete is the most abundant man made material on the planet. Two, Carbon Cure is crossing what can feel like chasms between people like us fighting climate change and those in traditional conservative industries. Christie's role in all of this is as a self-described bridge builder. She has to show the architects, engineers, policymakers, and contractors the benefits of Carbon Cure's technology for the planet and for their bottom line. And it's working. In just a decade, Carbon Cure has grown from just a few employees to 160, and their products are now used by 600 concrete producers in 25 countries. They're on a mission to remove 500 million metric tons of carbon emissions by the year 2030. That's right around the corner. And this is huge because concrete is used in apartment buildings, sidewalks, roads. It's everywhere. And as Christy says, there's only one material that's more common in our world than concrete. 
So it's actually the second most abundant material period after water. And because of its abundance, it has such this massive impact on the environment. First things first, we need to talk about the difference between concrete and cement. The two are not the same. And I have to admit, I was confused. Cement is like the glue that holds concrete together. Concrete is what we see everywhere in our buildings and in our sidewalks. So cement is an ingredient in concrete and a super toxic one. It accounts for about 7% of the world's CO2 emissions. So the magic of Carbon Cures technology is that it makes concrete with way less cement in order to slash those greenhouse gases. Yeah, when I heard about Carbon Cure, I was like, wait, what? So here's how it works. First, they buy captured CO2 from other companies. Carbon Cures technology takes the CO2 that is captured from the atmosphere and injects it into concrete, where the concrete happens to chemically convert the CO2 into a stone. And so we are trapping that CO2 forever because we're actually getting rid of it. We're turning it into something else. We're rethinking carbon dioxide, not as this greenhouse gas pollution, but as an ingredient that makes concrete stronger. It's also the most carbon intensive ingredient and the most expensive ingredient. So by being able to use less cement, the concrete producer is able to reduce its carbon footprint even further because cement is what gave it its carbon footprint in the first place. But also the concrete producer is able to realize cost savings that make this whole process financially beneficial for, for the industry. It's a win-win-win. A win for the product, a win for the planet, and a win for the bottom line. At first, Carbon Cure had to prove their product is just as durable as the traditional concrete, whether it's being used in a grocery store in Texas or a highway in Hawaii. Christy told me about one of Carbon Cure's first projects, a bus station in Halifax, Nova Scotia. That's where the company was founded. I recall back in February of 2015, pouring concrete in the winter in Nova Scotia at 5 a.m. It was probably minus 30 degrees Celsius outside. I was just going to say it sounds cold. (laughs) But it was one of the most exciting concrete pours to be on because this was a real life application of the use of carbon cure. Fast forward, now we're pouring airport pavement, which is one of the most stringent kind of concrete applications out there. Airport concrete needs to meet a lot of requirements. Christy told me about working with the International Airport in Calgary, Alberta. I worked very closely with the Calgary Airport Authority, with the structural engineers who are part of this project to help answer their questions, help assess whether the use of carbon here was appropriate for this particular application. It has to be really strong for those planes, has to be really smooth, has to withstand all of the elements that it's facing between the weather and the chemicals. Like, would this concrete fail under extreme summer heat? Or would the runway buckle in the frigid Canadian winters? And how would it interact with the de-icing chemicals? And it has performed not only to expectations, but beyond. And I've personally sat on that tarmac in Calgary And being the most excited person on the plane, I remember the very first time it happened, I was sitting there, you know, we're getting our plane de-iced. It's December. And of course, we have to wait for 30 minutes before we take off to go to Disneyland or wherever we're going. And (laughs) I was looking about at this concrete tarmac going, this is our concrete. This is so (laughs) exciting. And I'm pretty sure all of the passengers are just looking at me like, what's wrong with her? (laughs) First time on a plane. Just kidding. Does it look different? You could not tell the difference between carbon cure concrete and the corresponding regular concrete. And that's one of the most important properties of our technology. This is so critical for the finishers of concrete, the engineers of buildings, the owners of these pavements, is that it looks like concrete, it performs like concrete, it smells like concrete. It is just the normal concrete, but with a reduced carbon footprint. That success story might make Christie's job sound pretty easy. I'm sure you've heard more than your fair share of stories about startups that have grown big, fast. It can sound so simple. But Carbon Cure's success didn't happen overnight. Over the last nine years, Christie's job has been to address concerns about this newfangled concrete, to convince an engineer or a contractor, whether they care about climate change or not, to use Carbon Cure. 
to be a bridge between the sustainable design minds and the players in the global concrete industry. Traditionally, these two industries operate in different spaces. They're in different political spectrums. They're in different kinds of conferences and organizations. And so the role that Carbon Care has played has been to bring these conversations together. Part of this is also working with policymakers to allow for new kinds of concrete to be used. The reverse side of it is that the concrete industry itself has a lot of innovation in the space but has faced a number of barriers with traditional engineering specifications. The concrete that's poured on sidewalks, for example, that is procured by government organizations, it has these requirements that are so outdated and so prohibitive of any kind of sustainable innovation that it it doesn't allow for the use of technologies like carbon cure. And so your typical sidewalks, has way more cement than it needs to perform the way we would expect a sidewalk to perform. And that's just due to the legacy of the way that governments build. It frustrates me to think that sidewalks policy is what's stopping sustainable adaptations in concrete. That's far from the only frustration that Christy experiences, although she professes to liking the conflict inherent in her job. Like the time a client told her climate change wasn't real. One time, very early in my career, I think it was about 2014, when I was sitting with one of our new concrete partners and I was talking about the Paris Agreement and climate change and trying to showcase why this was important that we work together. And the one person in the room stopped me and said, wait a minute, do not use the word climate change in front of me. This is not real. It is a hoax. And I am not interested but tell me more about this business opportunity. Interesting. And that was really interesting to me to learn how to speak the language that would resonate. What I did really find is the same person, even though they did not believe in climate change science, they were very committed to serving their community. And so when we spoke about it in the context of minimizing the pollution within their community and making sure that the air was cleaner in the communities that they served, to them, it really resonated. They wanted to do the right thing. They just weren't necessarily educated on all of the science behind climate change in itself. And so what I've learned over time is to really adapt the language to what motivates individuals. And most individuals that I have encountered are motivated to help other people. I agree. I think everyone cares about climate change because everyone has at least one other person that they care about and their future that they care about. So if you can tap into that. Exactly. I'm a very big believer in understanding personal motivations. My undergraduate degree was in anthropology and psychology. At the time, I didn't really know what I was wanting to achieve with that particular degree. But the reason I studied those subjects was because I was so interested in learning about human behavior. And so I apply those same kind of principles to every discussion that I have of understanding what are the motivators for this individual person. And so I tend to talk about the individual community impact that the adoption of a technology can have with that organization. Also, of course, a lot of businesses are really looking at the the dollars and cents. We we talk about the dollars and cents. I'm a firm believer that sustainable innovation needs to make business sense in order for it to be scaled across the globe. These two go hand in hand. Now, Christy didn't grow up dreaming of peacemaking between climate deniers and environmentalists. But first, a short break. As a kid, Christy grew up in rural Saskatchewan. Her community was traditional, conservative. They certainly wouldn't call themselves environmentalists, she said, but still, Christy felt a strong connection to nature, thanks to her grandmother. She had this most magnificent garden, and I can still taste how raspberries taste off the bush and peas when you pick them out of the pod. And I think for me, that was my first real connection of just being out in the garden for hours and, and being appreciative of how fresh these vegetables and fruit were when you when you grow them and, and give them this tender, loving care. 
And my grandmother was the kind of person who would reuse every margarine container, who would pickle her vegetables and use them all year. And she did that in order to save costs as somebody who grew up during the Great Depression. But as I got older and became more educated on the climate challenge that we're all facing, I began to see how much that lifestyle really makes a difference in terms of an individual human's environmental impact. And so that was really a motivating factor for me to become more in tune with my own personal impacts on the environment, but also to position myself to be in a career where I can make a difference. Just wanting to make a difference. Does this resonate with you? It's something I hear all the time from folks looking for jobs tackling climate change. And trust me, when Christy was picking raspberries and dreaming about making a difference in the world, she had no idea she'd be doing it at a company like Carbon Cure. I can definitely tell you that if you asked me 10 years ago what industry I was going to be in, I probably would not have said concrete. (laughs) What would you have said? I would have said something that was saving the world. I know that uh, many listeners are trying to figure out what their own career path is going to look like. Like many people who are in sustainability, it was not a straight line. I originally went to university with the intention of being a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to help people. But it turns out the study of medicine itself was not something I really loved. And so I had one of those 3 a.m. decisions where I switched from a pre-med path to all of a sudden embracing what I loved, which was anthropology and psychology and the study of people. After working for a few years, she got a master's in business in a program at Dalhousie University. The program focused on ESG, environmental and social governance in business. When she started looking for jobs, she ended up at a career cocktail hour where she met the founder of Carbon Cure. At that point, it was a small startup working on an enormous problem, a problem she knew nothing about. And I do recall sitting with Rob Niven, our CEO and founder, in a job interview where he said, what do you know about concrete? And I looked at him and said, probably nothing. (laughs) And he asked me, well, let's start with the basics. What's the difference between cement and concrete? And I kind of gave him this blank stare and said, I thought they were the same thing. (laughs) Even though Christy didn't know much about the industry, her people skills got her the job. Soon, she was just one of a handful of people at Carbon Cure trying to reinvent the concrete industry. The office that I sat in was about 12 feet by 12 feet, and there were anywhere between four to six of us at any given time, basically sitting around this table, working away. And it was sweaty and hot because it was cramped. But we we did have a beer fridge that really helped spur <laughs> the innovation, keep us cool. Creativity. Uh, yeah, get some creativity. And it was exciting. I remember the day that our first revenue check came in. It was $142. It was a big day. And so it was very exciting to be part of a team that had the same unbridled optimism of looking at this extremely hard to abate industry and thinking, you know, we're going to make an impact on this. We're going to do this. In many ways, we were so naive because I think if we knew how hard it would be, we might have been persuaded from choosing a different industry. But it turns out that I think that optimism and that naivety was our biggest strength, our superpower, because we just, we went for it. And we worked with some of the best architects and some of the best engineers and the producers, the concrete producers who were leading the industry. We talked to government policymakers who were influencing the way that concrete was being procured. To try and revolutionize an industry like concrete, you have to have Christie's unbridled optimism. Because let's get real, cleaning up concrete is a mammoth task. If concrete were its own nation, it would be the third largest emitter in the world behind the US and China. At the same time, highways are not gonna stop needing repair. People aren't gonna stop needing homes and schools. Buildings are not going to stop being built. Carbon Cure predicts that the world's buildings are expected to double by 2060. This means that we're on track to build a new New York City every month. The unstoppable construction was weighing on me. I told Christy. So even though Carbon Cure is reducing concrete emissions, all of this development is still making climate change worse. How do you square helping companies build more buildings 
that are more environmentally friendly with the need to clean up industry, especially with the rate of growth that we're facing. One of the things we know for sure is that global population is growing. And if we want to live more sustainably as a global community, we need to build more dense urban centers. That is the most sustainable way is to minimize the amount of transportation people do on a regular basis, to minimize the number of buildings that people are living in. And so that requires more construction and that requires more concrete. More concrete. Ugh. Remember, it's already the most abundant man-made material on Earth. Christy says there's a good reason for this. It allows these buildings to be safe, to help people withstand the impacts of a changing climate. She's not wrong. All people need a safe, sustainable place to live. Not all development is a bad thing, but it has to be done sustainably. This means thinking about emissions from the start, not just after that new office is open for business or the new apartments are open for rent. The amount of carbon it takes to make a building is called embodied carbon. It's a way to measure emissions that developers are just catching on to. If you want a job in design or urban planning, you definitely need to know about it. We also know that once the embodied carbon footprint has been emitted, so once that building has been built, that CO2 is up in the atmosphere. There's no going back and fixing it short of pulling that CO2 from the atmosphere. We could take a look at any building, for example, that has been constructed, and we can, in theory, go back and retrofit it with energy efficient type of systems in order to minimize and reduce and potentially eliminate its operational impact. But we can't do anything about the embodied carbon impact other than building it right the first time. So like with all emissions goals, there's no time to waste. That prediction that global buildings will double by 2060 Christy says a good chunk of those will be built in the next 10 years, not the next 40, the next 10. So next time you're out on a walk around your neighborhood, I bet you can see it happening. We cannot afford to wait a decade before significantly reducing the embodied carbon impact of these buildings. If we do that, it's going to be too late. To Christy, it's an urgent environmental justice issue. Like a lot of things we talk about here, Christy says concrete emissions disproportionately affect people who live in developing nations and poorer communities. And so it's really critical to ensure that these industries that are part of the global carbon emissions are now developing solutions to reduce their emissions and to reduce them quickly, because we are at risk of putting a lot of people into very dangerous situations due to rising sea levels and increased climate events. And so we have a moral responsibility to minimize those impacts as much as possible and also to adapt to them, to ensure that these communities are developing infrastructure that can keep people safe and dry in these various types of climate events. Drought and wildfires, melting ice caps, hurricanes. As you know, climate change is here. And our infrastructure is not ready. Christy told me about a carbon cure project with Hawaii, a state that's facing a huge threat from rising sea levels. The Hawaii government is going to have to rebuild most of the highways across Hawaii because the island of Oahu, the highway runs right along the coast. And within 20 years, that highway will be underwater. So they know they need to rebuild the highways. And they are also committed to doing that in a way that is not going to further exacerbate the problem. And so they are asking for the most innovative solutions out there to be as sustainable as possible. But at the same time, you think about this impact that it's having of these rising sea levels and how this is going to destroy homes and upend people from the communities that they have known their entire lives. And it just really provides a very tangible motivation to take action and minimize these impacts as much as we humanly can right now. Key to solving this is going to be a lot of collaboration. So one of the hardest challenges the construction industry faces is the complexity that it involves a lot of different stakeholders. If we look at a concrete building, for example, we need the concrete producer to adopt the sustainable technology. We also need the engineer to write design specifications that allow or encourage the use of the sustainable technology in order to be allowed in the infrastructure. 
We need governments who procure 40% of the world's concrete to change the way that they build concrete structures because government structures are using some of the most outdated design methods out there. So we need all of these different kinds of organizations, governments, the builders of buildings and um, organizations who are construction manufacturing plants, for example, or data centers to change the way that they are designing and procuring concrete. And the hardest part about all of this is aligning everybody in the same mission in time. So we're going to need business leaders willing to forge new relationships. Christy also says that this challenge of cleaning up industry presents endless opportunities for scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs. The year Carbon Cure co-won the X Prize, there were 2,500 applications with ideas reimagining CO2 to save the planet. Imagine all of the new jobs and skills these innovations will bring. I think what's exciting about these careers is that they really could come from any corner, any kind of skill set. One particular skill set that I really see being in high demand over the coming years is carbon accounting, data management. You can't manage what you can't measure. The carbon accounting as it exists today is an imperfect science, and that's okay. We're working off of the information we have to make it better. But the better the information is, the better those solutions will be. What's really interesting is that the path to sustainability is not always a direct line. One of the many opportunities I see in sustainability careers is something we haven't even really conceptualized. We need experts in all these different fields that impact the environment who are aligned on this mission to reduce the carbon impact of these industries, but who have industry and product expertise to now come up with practical solutions. If you look at concrete as a great example, the best solutions for concrete sustainability are going to come from those with concrete production expertise. And so if you come from an engineering background or a business background, a software background, and figure out how to marry whatever skill sets and industry knowledge you have with that objective, how does your industry impact climate? What can you do about it? I think those are the exact questions people need to be asking themselves. It's a look inward more than looking outward to figure out how you, in your moment, with your experience and your passion and knowledge, can make an impact. If you ask my seven-year-old daughter, we need to invent the bee bot, which is going to replicate the bee flying around to pollinating the different uh, flowers and, and plants. We need to invent more technologies that are going to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and somehow find something beneficial to do with that CO2 so that we can get rid of it forever. We need to find ways to turn waste into valuable products. So I think what's really exciting is just the concept of reimagining waste, reimagining carbon dioxide, reimagining garbage, landfill, uh, food consumption. And figuring out what can we do with this and how can we reuse, recycle these types of materials or these greenhouse gas emissions for something that can be beneficial for another purpose. Christy's daughter and her bee bot, which I'm a big fan of, by the way. Well, it has a lot to do with how Christy has navigated this job with all of the challenges along the way. Why she's as inspired now, if not more so than she was nine years ago in that little office with a beer fridge. I joined Carbon Cure before I had children with this intense desire to be able to uh, decarbonize the, the concrete industry and to be able to provide a social good through my career. When I had children, it became more personal to me. It became something that I realized I'm not just operating on behalf of all humans. I'm operating on behalf of my own children. My daughter has become a, a champion for the environment. Wow. Uh, she might have learned from her mom. Maybe that's possible. I think so. What's so exciting is how she just comes up with these solutions. She likes to invent new technologies that are just going to save the planet. And she says, well, why don't we do this? She's also invented uh, drones that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. And she has recently, we're in the car and she said, I'm going to be the mayor and I'm going to declare that nothing can ever be thrown out. Everything has to be uh, recycled. And I just love how her optimism and determinism is not 
marred by any kind of pragmatism. You know, why wouldn't we be able to do these things? Even within our own community, two years ago, uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, which is where I live, elected our first female mayor. And my daughter came with me to the polling booth. She was a little bit upset that she wasn't allowed to vote either. But she was there for me while I cast my vote. And she was very excited when the woman that we had voted for won the election. And so she's growing up now where her world perspective is that she can be anything. Well, and what a different world they're growing up in than than we did to have that idea that this could be a career path, number one, that you could be a woman leading in it, and that the possibilities are endless and that solutions are necessary. I'm excited for you and your daughter to be the first uh, mother-daughter XPRIZE winners in XPRIZE history someday with the BeBot and other innovations. I love that. Challenge accepted. Christy, talking about her daughter, made me think of my own girls. It makes me feel so, so good that they'll see more women leading in business, sustainability, innovation, and politics than I or Christy did when we were their age. Because it will come as no surprise that Christy's journey to becoming a powerful female leader in the concrete industry wasn't always easy. I have personally found that I have made an extra effort to make sure that I am technically sound in terms of my own knowledge. I do find that I've encountered situations where it might surprise people on the other end of the line that I know how to talk shop when it comes to concrete. And those same people wouldn't necessarily have been surprised at my ability to talk shop if I were male. Throughout her career, she has seen more and more women enter the field which is spurring change in the industry. We're seeing more female leaders. We're seeing people with more diverse backgrounds and profiles coming into the industry. And this is critical for the industry succeeding. And, you know, it can be challenging at times. You have to uh, certainly be confident in the direction that you're going. It may have taken Christy several years to build up her own confidence, But it's a lesson she's teaching both her kids from an early age, that and many of the skills that are vital to saving the planet. One of the things that my husband and I are both very keen on teaching our kids is A, to have that kind of optimism and determination to do anything, but B, to realize that these kinds of uh, ambitions are not just going to uh, be presented to them on a silver platter, that they have to understand the value of hard work and they have to learn how to read material and understand the facts and also listen to different perspectives. I think one of the things that I really have found in my own career has been so important is being able to understand and relate to different people who come from different backgrounds, who might be sitting in different political spectrums, but find alignment in terms of where We want to accomplish things together. And so I think if uh, we can do anything, it's to help our children develop empathy for other humans, uh, develop the ability to reason, but also to acknowledge when maybe they were wrong. Maybe they are, maybe they do have a misperception about how something's operating. And I think that's something that's very missing a lot of times in conversations is this acknowledgement of maybe I'm not right. And how do I learn? How do I grow from this? And how do I adapt? Now it's time for Ask Yesh, where I help you with your biggest green career challenges. Send me your questions on Twitter at Yesh Says with the hashtag Ask Yesh. Today, how to balance mission and money. Here's the big question from an anxious job seeker. I really want to get a job fighting climate change, but I'm worried that I'll be broke. I want to have a family and I have whopping student loan debt. Can you really make any money with a green career? Well, first of all, thank you for sharing this. It is so hard to talk about money. There is definitely a perception about green jobs that you can't do what you're passionate about and live the lifestyle you want. But that's just not true. Heck yes, you can make great money with a green career. Seven of the top 10 in-demand green jobs, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, pay over $70,000 a year. The thing is, not all jobs in all industries pay the same. We know this. 
And as you figure out how to apply your passion for climate work to a career, you've got to do your research. For instance, if you want to work in community organizing focused on environmental justice, you're probably going to make less than someone starting out at a corporation in a sustainability role. Same goes for working in city government versus a large consulting firm. There's just a huge spectrum for salaries, but I know that the money is there. I do want to say this, though. Regardless of the pay, even if you're remotely considering a green career, you need to listen to that inner voice. You'll be more likely to be happy in your work, have job stability, and this is something that really resonates with me, have invaluable bonds with people who work just as hard as you to save the planet. And you said you wanted a family? Well, as a parent, I constantly worry about my kids, but using my career to fight climate change is one of the most important and fulfilling ways that I advocate for their future. If you don't start on this path today, I can almost guarantee that you'll waste time and energy when you finally decide that you have to work on this issue 10 years from now. That's time and effort that neither you nor the planet have to waste. So good luck, anxious job seeker. Your wallet doesn't have to suffer. You can get paid and paid well to save the planet. What's the problem you're facing? I really do want to hear from you. Again, send me your question on Twitter at Yesh Says, and you might hear the answer right here on Degrees. And that's it for this episode. Make sure to listen and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you're listening now. And share this podcast with a friend so you can both tune in each week and hear how you can help fight climate change together and learn where the jobs are and how you can make a difference. On the next episode of Degrees, can you use your MBA to fight climate change? Jenny McCullough, Chief Sustainability Officer at McDonald's and a Climate Corps alum, doesn't just say yes. She says big business needs you. Degrees is presented by Environmental Defense Fund. Amy Morse is our producer. Podcast Allies is our production company. Tressa Versteg, Elaine Grant, and Rye Taylor worked on this episode with help from Elizabeth Miller. Our music is Shame, Shame, Shame by my favorite band, Lake Street Dive. And I'm your host, Yesh Pavlik Slink. But the foundation of this show, my friends, is you. So stay fired up, y'all. Change is coming, oh yeah. Ain't no holding it back Ain't no running Change is coming, oh yeah My first job was working in a curling rink. When I was 12 years old, I was bussing tables in the curling rink bar. Wow. Very exciting back when you were 12 years old to make $6 an hour and you work for three hours and all of a sudden you have $18. What are you going to do with that? Do you know how many Beanie Babies you can buy when you're a 12-year-old back in 1997? (laughs) I bought a lot of Beanie Babies. I later sold them for about a third of the price.